We turn now to a subject that is really interesting to me personally, a debate within the diabetes community over what really is good control. Is it simply about the goals doctors set for their patients? Trying for an A1C of 5 can be discouraging, but an A1C of over 7 may be dangerous. Our guests today have different opinions and approaches to diabetes care. Dr. Howard Wolpert is a senior physician at the Jocelyn Clinic in Boston. Dr. Richard Bernstein is a diabetologist from Westchester County, New York, and author of Diabetes Solution. Gentlemen, welcome to D-Life. Let's start by talking about A1C goals. In your opinion, what is a good A1C goal? Let's start with you, Dr. Bernstein. Diabetics are entitled to the same blood sugars and the same A1Cs as non-diabetics. Non-diabetics, whom I have tested, run between 4.2 and 4.6. So I think that's a reasonable range for diabetics. And it's reasonably easy to obtain. Reasonable? Dr. Wolpert, realistic? What do you think? Well, that's obviously the ideal in the sense of reducing risk for long-term complications. But I think when one gets down to practicalities, for most people, those are impossibly difficult uh, goals to measure up to. I mean, the American Diabetes Association has come out of a, a goal of less than 7% for hemoglobin A1C. But obviously, one strives for whatever a patient can accomplish without them running into problems with, with severe hypoglycemia. So, Dr. Bernstein, is this realistically achievable by patients with diabetes? What do they have to do to achieve goals that you set? It's very easy and it's very commonplace to put the onus on the patient that some patients are not up to this. It's the physicians who are not up to this. They don't have the time and that's what's so unfortunate about the system and it really should be farmed out to paramedical people and to working with patients in groups. Doctors can't make money doing this. Dr. Wolpert, that's an interesting statement. Is it about the system and the doctor or is it about the patient? Uh, why don't you weigh in on that? Oh, that, without question, I think Dr. Bernstein is, is correct on, on, on that score. But I think philosophically, there, there's, there's a, a difference in, in our approaches. I view myself as a, a diabetes clinician primarily as a coach. I mean, there to actually engage the patient and get them uh, focused on um, improving their diabetes control as best they can. And I think mm -hmm. one of the key issues is not to actually overload the patients with over-idealized goals like Dr. Bernstein sort of describes, because for many people that just becomes a, a recipe for... Self-defeat. Exactly. How do we manage patients to goals without making them feel like they're failing. I think the one thing one doesn't want to do is actually give a value judgment to these numbers. It's not about a number being bad because I think for many patients the A1C is not just simply a measure objectively of their glucose control but it's a measure of their competence and their self-worth and I think mm -hmm. one needs to be very sensitive to um, how one actually describes the uh, the goals or the level that they're they're measuring up to the challenge really is in terms of giving people a program that can they can kind of s stick with so right. when it comes to uh, meal plans for example or um, eating behaviors I think it's, it's it's a matter of actually giving people goals and slowly kind of advancing them because for most people it's a matter of actually changing their habits so that they become routine so doctor what do you think about that you might be you know putting these kind of challenges upon your patients and beating them up might defeat them. Um, and have you lost patients who have felt defeated and just couldn't do it? Very rarely have we lost patients. Uh, getting a person to switch to a low carbohydrate diet, which is essential, there's no way to control blood sugars on a high carbo diet. You have to do it fast, all at once. Otherwise, it takes forever. Those where you change them immediately, they lose the cravings and you forge ahead and they see the results. When patients see the payoff, they stick with it. Dr. Wolper, can we replicate Dr. Bernstein's approach across the diabetes population? Well, it really depends on the patient's uh, level of motivation is that he's describing people who, because they have complications, for example, feel very um, activated. Mm -hmm. um, so to speak, to, to get uh, on top of and control with their diabetes. That doesn't necessarily ap ap apply to everyone. And, um, you know, food is one of the pleasures of life. People 
want to uh, indulge occasionally. And I think one has to sort of set up a program that kind of allows people a certain amount of flexibility. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, one, one, one of the challenges here is, is that if it comes down to a situation where the demands of diabetes sort of control one's life and one's routine, for many people that becomes too much of a, a price to pay. Well, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. This is an extremely important subject. We can talk about it more and more. We'll be right back with more from Dr. Wolford and Dr. Bernstein. I'm here with Dr. Howard Wolford and Dr. Richard Bernstein. So, gentlemen, we spend a lot of time during the day managing our blood sugars. We're awake. But at night, while we're sleeping, we can't make the corrections and test our blood sugar as we would during the day. How can we manage this? Dr. Bernstein? The key to it is small doses of insulin given in a physiologic fashion. For example, if you give a large dose of a long-acting insulin at bedtime, you're asking for trouble. It should be split into two smaller doses. Furthermore, if you're expecting to cover your meals with a long-acting insulin, you're asking for trouble at least if you're dealing with type 1 diabetics, should have fast acting before meals, small amount of long acting at bedtime, and on arising in the morning. Let me understand, are you suggesting you wake up and take a second dose of insulin? No, you get a dose of insulin at bedtime, you get a dose of insulin when you wake up in the okay. morning. It's long acting and the amounts are small. Well now what about type 2's who aren't on insulin? Type 2's who are not on insulin we don't have to worry about the hypoglycemia unless they're taking oral hypoglycemic agents. Dr. Wolpert, what about these terms I've heard and never really understood, dawn phenomenon and Samoji effect where you have high blood sugars during the night or in the morning that are caused by something else? Well, there are a number of different hormonal uh, responses that can develop in response to hypoglycemia, which would be the case of the Samoji phenomenon, which is a rebound increase in the glucose. So what happens when the glucose level goes down low, the body will produce so-called chondroitry hormones like um, adrenaline, and these will trigger the liver to produce glucose. And the end result is that a person may, may arise, or this can also occur during the day with a high blood sugar. Um, the dawn phenomenon uh, relates to um, growth hormone spikes which occur um, overnight, which will trigger the, glu the liver to produce glucose. And this particularly uh, manifests itself during the, the, the dawn period when people mm -hmm. are getting up. I think the, the key issue around this, though, is that individual responses physiologically will vary quite a lot. So for some people, you'll see a very pronounced dawn phenomenon. But in other people, um, there's no dawn phenomenon um, at all. And the same thing applies with, with rebound. So what can we do about this, these kind of unpredictable or hormonal causes for blood sugar variation? Well, for the, for the dawn phenomenon, um, that comes down to actually individualizing the uh, insulin replacement approach. So for someone with a type 1 diabetes, the option there may be uh, an insulin pump where one can uh, vary the uh, basal insulin replacement, increase it during the, during the dawn period. Uh, there are also situations where one can use um, uh, longer acting intermediate insulin to try and um, uh, control that. That sound right to you, Dr. Bernstein? The, the last part, the, the Samoji effect, if you look through his papers, there's never any hard evidence of an automatic response. Mm. I have seen no evidence amongst my patients of any kind of rebound from low blood sugars except from overeating. So That's it's all that. about the food you eat. Right. That's now, the say. dawn phenomenon yeah. is for real. Uh, if I get up in the morning, I'll typically have a blood sugar, say, of 85. By breakfast time, an hour later, I'll be up to 130. And this applies to virtually all of my type 1 patients and even to some type 2 patients. So, by the way, we should point out that you yourself have type 1 diabetes, right, Dr. That's Bernstein? correct. So the dawn phenomenon is certainly something you both agree on and that needs to be paid attention to and work with your doctor on how to, how to manage that. Dr. Wolpert, I've heard this expression, uh, bed dead or dead bed. Can you shed a little light on this? There, there has been a description in the literature of uh, a case of situations where people with, with type 1 diabetes have been uh, found uh, dead um, overnight. And it's thought to be related to, to hypoglycemia. 
um, with that uh, triggering some arrhythmia or irregularity of the heartbeat uh -huh. uh, being the root cause there. And that happens in a very small percentage of uh, patients, so it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be striking fear into the diabetes uh, population. Yes, it's a very small subset of people, but I think it's the, a shadow which hangs over a lot of people and which holds them back from, from uh, trying to strive to tighten up of, on their glucose control. Is there uh, a protocol for handling overnight low blood sugars? Well, insulin pump is certainly a way of actually um, minimizing risk for hypoglycemia overnight because with an insulin pump, one has much more predictable insulin delivery. Um, I think the promise of continuous glucose sensors will help uh, yeah, many absolutely. people in minimizing that problem as well. Well, there's no doubt there's great tools and more and more great tools to help manage the condition. Thanks to both of you for coming in. Obviously, two different points of view, but very valuable information that our audience needs to hear for them to talk to their doctor about how to manage their diabetes. Struggling with your control? Visit us online at dlife.com slash askanexpert to ask our team of experts your diabetes questions.